Hi everybody, old guy here, and sometimes I read a book so you don't have to. That's the case for this book, Hervey Allen's Unnecessarily Long Epic Human Saga, Epic Drama, Historical Family Saga Epic. Not that I'm saying you shouldn't read it. You can. But understand that you're going to spend several days, if not weeks, uh, at about a 51% irritated mood if you do. And why is that? Because Hervey Allen firmly believes in the written word. A lot of written words. A lot of unnecessary written words. Many times strung together in the most baffling manner possible. Four to eight running pages that leave you going, huh? There were many instances where I was left completely unable to picture the scene he just spent what felt like ten pages describing. So, why did I even read this then? Well, because I had a copy. Uh, again, no idea where I got this from. Uh, probably, um, I think I got it at a used bookstore somewhere near Harrisonburg, Virginia. And, and I knew the title. I mean, I'd run across it before, but not the author. And I thought, eh, this must be then a modernist tale of a young man struggling to make his way in pre-Depression America. Now, I don't know why I thought that. Uh, I guess it had to do because of the title, and the edition that I picked up here was published in 1933. Boy, was I wrong. This is the story of Anthony, the illegitimate son of a married Marquesa and her Scottish soldier lover in pre-Napoleonic Italy. Uh, Anthony is left in a portal of a nunnery's wall after Don Luis, the Marquis, kills the soldier in a duel and the Marquesa prem pre prematurely delivers. The first hundred pages concern itself almost exclusively with the Marquesa and her cuckolded husband before Anthony even makes his appearance. But it's a fairly compelling story, so read on. Anthony, when he's old enough, gives himself the family name of Adverse, after he leaves the nunnery where he had received a very decent education from Father Xavier, who obtains employment for Anthony as a clerk in the firm of John Bonnyfeather, who happens to be Anthony's grandfather, which no one knows until Bonnie Feather and Father Xavier figure it out. There's lots and lots of odd coincidences like this throughout the book, which I guess isn't all that odd because these people all circulate in a small society, so they're bound to run into each other. Anthony ends up hobnobbing with Napoleon, various Reyes and Alcaldes, an African and Muslim princes, and the Lafitte brothers before it's all over. Gaining and losing several fortunes and kingdoms of his own before the book ends in the Mexican desert some decades after he was shoved through the nunnery's portal. He even ends up in a worldwide conflict with Don Luis, narrowly avoiding a trap Luis sets to throw Anthony off the side of an alpine pass. Don Luis does, though, end up throwing Anthony into a Mexican prison. As you can see, there's some exciting moments in this. It just takes you hundreds of pages to get to one and then hundreds of pages until you get to the next one. And boy, is this a racist book. I mean, egregious racism 
with Anth with Anthony actually becoming a slaver uh, on the west coast of Africa with his own slave compounds and slave ships plying the trade with Havana. I have not read such astoundingly jaw-dropping justifications for the slave trade outside of all that lost cause literature that was written in the 1880s. It is rather stunning, uh, as is the sex. There's lots of unbridled sex in this book, gay sex included, which doesn't really reach pornographic levels, but uh, it's pretty descriptive. I guess that's the modernist in Hervey Allen, who was a literature professor in the 1930s and a good friend of Robert Frost, so he knew about Hemingway and Joyce and Eliot. So you got to ask yourself the question then, why in the world did he decide to write this epic in a pseudo-18th century style with pages-long paragraphs and paragraphs-long sentences, all in stilted dead language. I can't say. Uh, I can speculate that uh, he's reacting against the sparse, minimalist stream of consciousness style of his uh, contemporaries, fighting a rearguard action to protect the uh, turgid classicism that professors of his day admired. Or maybe he just wanted to be different than, his con than everybody else, prove that there is still a place for classic forms, which there is. But it's better left to the actual classics, not to wannabes. Old guy here, see you later.